Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. There's a joke there, which a lot of people know about. Uh, that's okay. my, Al- my Alfred Hitchcock moment from months ago. Um, Rick was talking a lot about the interconnectedness of uh, alcoholism and ego, and that's that's certainly true. Uh, I remember talking to uh, my first sponsor, Ted, uh, way back when, and we were looking at uh, alcoholism, ego, and self, and specifically ego. He said, one of your problems is you think that you're somebody you are not. And um, you think you're this, this, this Ron guy, and you've got this Ron body and this Ron personality, and you... And you have, you've got a job and you've got relationships and, and, um, you buy into this human experience and, and in fact, um, the society that we grow up in teaches us that we are a product of our human experience. And, and what Ted said was, uh, in reality, uh, who I am and who we all are is a spiritual being, a, a God created being. Uh, who ha- is having a human experience, but who and what we really are is the essence of who we are is the spiritual being. And he said that's really critical to know, um, because to live successfully and to live happily and usefully whole, <coughs> we have to be real to who we really are. That um, a lot of our dysfunction comes from trying to be something we are not. So if if, uh, if I'm a fish and I have to fly like a bird to be happy in the life that I'm in, I'm not going to be and I'm not going to accept the world the way it is. Uh, that may be a somewhat simplistic example, but um, I will speak for myself. Uh, acceptance has been one of my challenges in sobriety, accepting everything exactly as it is. So ego... Um, in very simple terms, I mean, it can be this is me feeling better than you are or worse than you are. In my case, um, mostly it was the underside, me feeling worse than everybody else, not worthy, so on and so forth. Um, Sigmund Freud, way back when, the 1900s, somewhere around there, um, started studying people, and he was trying to figure out what makes all of us tick. And he figured out, we, he, to, to figure that, to understand that, that we needed to go back to understanding babies and how they uh, developed and what was going on. So he developed this, this theory called uh, His Majesty the Baby. And in the womb, His Majesty uh, is given everything that he needs, all the food whenever he wants it, all the loving support, all the warmth, everything is there at all times exactly when it's needed. And then we're born into this world, and all of a sudden, the little monarch isn't quite so happy. Um, so he, he, he looked at His Majesty the baby, and he found some specific qualities of, of this baby. Uh, one of what is, one of which is, uh, the inability to accept frustration. Um, you know, all of a sudden, at, at a few hours old, I realize that I'm not getting fed on schedule when I want, and I'm not happy, so I cry. And I act out. Um, as a 60 year old, driving here in traffic, when that person cuts in front of me, it's violating my rights. That's my freeway. You know, that's, that's, that's my lane. And I'm frustrated. Same function. Um, impatience is another function of His Majesty the Baby. Uh, 
when you uh, see a group of kids going over to Grandma's house in the minivan, there's maybe 10-year-olds, 8-year-olds, 6-year-olds, 3-year-olds, and we get over to Grandma's house, the sliding door opens up, and immediately it's the 3-year-olds that are out the door, and over to the front door, banging on the door. Grandma, Grandma! This is a characteristic of impatience. If I don't get mine right now, I'm not going to get it. So I better get on and then get it right now. <laughs> and and as, a, as an adult, I could be impatient too. Somebody says, you know, we really don't have the money in the bank account to go buy that Ferrari right now. You know, maybe in 10 years, whatever, but do some work, you know, do what you're supposed to do. And So I think about that for two minutes, and I go to the Ferrari dealership. <laughs> Sign me up for one of those 50-year contracts, you know? I can't, I, can't, I can't wait that long. So this is another characteristic of His Majesty. And grandiosity is another characteristic. And the baby is just the monarch. This is just, I'm king. It's just because I am. And, and how that, that works out, uh, in, in adulthood is, uh, you know what? Uh, I just deserve that because my name's Ron. That's all there is to it. And I get upset with you or other people when things just don't happen the way the monarch wants. So these are characteristics of all babies, but, um, we find out later on from uh, a gentleman named Harry Tebow that they're really characteristics accentuated in the alcoholic. Sigmund Freud, when he um, was developing his theories and, and, and developing psychoanalysis, um, looked a little bit deeper and he came up with uh, some theories about uh, how we are made up psychically. You know, in the book it tells us we need to have a psychic change. And he said there's really kind of three aspects of the psyche. The first one is called the id. And this is kind of like the instinctual, um, the needs. This is the need to be fed. This is, you know, mommy changed my diapers. Um, this is all that kind of stuff. Later on as an adult, the instincts that they talk about in step four would be part of the id. Uh, this is a need to have everything right now. Uh, as we develop uh, and get a little bit older, perhaps a month or two of age, Freud uh, observed that uh, we develop something called the ego, spelled with a little e, and that this, this ego uh, was a moderator of the, the id, and it was an idea that, you know what, if I can just put off that need just a little bit longer, maybe a half an hour, maybe I'll get something even better a half an hour from now. I start figuring this out as a, as a, as a baby a few weeks old. So this little e ego starts developing. And a little bit farther along the way, uh, I start learning about right and wrong, and I start developing a conscience. And another aspect, according to Freud, starts developing called the superego, which is the, the, the God kind of aspect of me. I've got to be holy. I've got to be righteous. I've got to be perfect. Uh, and, and in this developing infant, the conscience or the superego is always kind of in conflict with the id, the instinctual, and the little e ego is in between, moderating between both of them. So, functionally, that's how Freud conceived this whole thing to be working out. So, fast forward a few years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and um, Harry Tebow comes along, and he starts observing the first... 100 recovered alcoholics. And he observes, and it's mentioned in, in step 12 in the 12 and 12, that we all were grandiose, 
had these qualities of, of a three-year-old and um, that characteristically we, we really were behaving like three-year-olds in adult bodies. In the Tebow papers, he discusses the way the word ego is used today and, and what he discusses in those papers is what really we do today in popular usage of the term ego is that we wrap all three of those things, it, ego, superego, into one term. We call it ego and we spell it with a capital E. It's in the Tebow papers. So on commercials or whatever else, when we're, when you, when we're using the term ego, and really I think in, in, in terms of alcohol, it's anonymous. That's what we're doing. We're using that term, capital E, ego. And, and what this is, is uh, really separation from. Uh, Chuck Chamberlain, gentleman who uh, gave a series of lectures which became the book and, and, and the audio tape, New Pair of Glasses, talks about the ego as just in its purest form being separation from. Separation from my Heavenly Father, my Creator, separation from my family, from my fellows, separation as if I'm the only person here on earth who's, who's I'm, I'm different from all seven and a half billion people. I'm, I'm absolutely unique. I come into Alcoholics Anonymous with a million people who have recovered or are recovering from alcoholism and I'm the only one who it won't work for. Uh, this is differentness. This is a function of my ego. And just about all of my upset, my restlessness, my irritability, all of this is coming from my ego. Because it's me being out there being somebody who I am not. For me not to accept you as you are, means that I have to believe I am a God, little g, of some sort. All of my upset issues come from my non-acceptance of what is. If I really, truly believed in God and, and turned my will and my life over to the care of that power, what issues would I have? God's the director, I'm the foot soldier, and the story. So for me to have a position on anything has to involve my ego, has to involve my separation from. Um, and this, this is where, uh, obviously a great deal of our work in Alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous is. I will tell you that, um, in my first five years of prime time and doing the spiritual work, that uh, I was doing, I did my level best to smash ego. That's what it says in the book, smash ego. More about alcoholism in the big book. Um, Tebow says, or talks about ego reduction happening through humility and surrender. Um, in my readings of the Tebow papers, I don't recall of anybody or Harry Tebow saying that anybody can ever get rid of ego. Um, this morning at work, I picked up the phone, I called somebody, and I said, Hi, my name is Ron. Buy my stuff. That's an ego statement. I'm always operating from this Ron idea of who I am. And, and it's a, in its essence, that's ego. So I think starting off this smashing of ego early on can certainly serve a purpose. Um, but I think as we grow spiritually, as we develop a relationship with God, um, it's really about taking our ego issues to God and healing. Um, part of my own personal process early on was 
understanding a lot of this material that we talk about here in, in prime time and in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Intellectually, if I just know this stuff, I'll have it, and then I'll get it. And um, whenever I would find myself in upset or in the ego position, I would go to this kind of thing that just says, hey, I'm spiritual now, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, and I would blow off that issue. Blow it off, stuff it down into my subconscious mind. And that's not really the way it works. That's why we have step four, step five, step six. Give my defects of character to a power greater than me. What I am finding now in my own personal life is um, understanding my ego issues and my separation from God can be used as a portal or a doorway into a fuller and more complete relationship with God. This is all about coming to believe. Uh, yes, you know, we all have jobs and families and personalities and all the rest of this stuff, but fundamentally, I feel the reason that we are here in the human experience is to come to believe and be a fuller and more complete version of God's kid. And in fact, that's probably the only thing that's going on. All the rest of it is just stuff. So, four or five years ago, I was going to seven meetings a week, and I was totally, completely enveloped in this AA cocoon, and I knew a place in peace that I had never known in my life. And I felt directed at that time, in, in, intuitively from God, that maybe I should go back to school, study some things, do some different things. And and I've done that. And um, I will tell you quite honestly that today I don't feel anywhere near as comfortable or spiritually intact as I was five years ago. There's times when I'm in a lot of irritation and I know it's ego. And yet there I am. There's times when... This is what I know is supposed to be. This is what the truth is, capital T, God's truth. And yet, emotionally, this is where I am over here. And and I need to take these things into God. This is what the process of all the steps are, all of them. And saying, God, help me figure this out. Help me help me deal with this. I can't I can't figure this out. And um, I also feel that even as I don't feel as completely spiritually cocooned today as maybe I did five years ago, that I am in fact doing what God would have me do. That what I'm supposed to be doing here is going into this stuff, going into my ego issues head on, as uncomfortable as they are, as painful as they may be, go into that stuff and bring God in with me for my own personal healing. And in that sense, understanding ego and how it functions, I think, can be actually a very, very important thing for all of us. Thank you. Can an alcoholic obtain slash maintain a healthy ego that has confidence in one's abilities or skills? Um, in step two, um, it tells me that uh, humility has to come first in the section on intellectuality. Um, at some level, I, I don't think I'm ever going to completely get rid of my ego, and yet I'm striving to develop as God would have me develop. So it, I guess it depends upon what you call me. Uh, 
the alcoholic, uh, on the power of Ron, uh, the little G God kind of me, uh, no, the answer is no. Uh, connected with God uh, and empowered by God, can I can I exist in the human experience as this this personality thing called Ron, which is ego? I think so. Maybe a little bit confusing. If somebody's brand new to this program, this kind of talk can be very confusing. Um, keep keep things simple, especially first off. Hey, let's just talk about smashing ego and let's get 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 into the program get into the principles, get God on, and then let's move forward. When does the monarch baby grow up? <laughs> How is this accomplished when denial isn't said out loud, but is still hiding in subconscious mind? Great question. Um, when does the monarch grow up? Uh, in the moment that I'm in, with a power greater than me. Um, I can be in wow wow land five minutes from now. I mean, it's just the way it is. How is this accomplished when denial isn't uh, laid out? Um, in step six, it tells us that uh, self does not reveal self to self. Um, I, I, without, without a relationship with God, I can't see this stuff. So denial is going to, is going to block any growth, any, any, um, release of ego or, or those issues, uh, or, or becoming more one with God. So it's all about God empowerment. Can you talk about defiance? <laughs> yeah, it, it's in it's it's part of the grandiosity and and, and the the aspects of um, of the ego. Um, in defiance in the book is, is we are we are told that defiance is the outstanding characteristic of us empowered by the power, in my case, of Ron. So, empowered by Ron, um, I'm not going to be in acceptance of anything. I'm going to be in, in defiance of everything. Um, my, my, the nature of who I am. Does, how does alcoholism intensify the ego to the point it becomes unmanageable. Well, again, first of all, if I have one of those things and I'm not treated in the moment that I'm in, I've got them both. Um, untreated, uh, alcoholism wants to kill me. Ego doesn't mind if I'm just mildly miserable for the rest of my life. In fact, ego doesn't want me to get too bad in too bad a shape because if I do, I'm going to hit my knees and say, God, will you help me? And if that happens, it's the death of ego. So the function of alcoholism is a little bit different. Alcoholism is out to kill me. And the two of them work together uh, below the level of conscious, conscious mind, um, this is not me figuring things out up here. I can't figure things out up here. I can go to a power and ask for God's power to to work through whatever I'm in, but I have to bring the willingness to the to the uh, situation there. I, it's uh, otherwise the two are going to go off on their own. Is having an opinion always bad? <laughs> And there's a second second question that I'll get to, and that that's it's actually a great great point. Um, we just we just uh, had an election, 
And I don't know if you were watching some of the commercials. If you were in Ohio, you were probably ready to shoot yourself. Um, there was a lot of venom and a lot of um, all kinds of uh, just bad energy going on. And having an opinion is not necessarily bad, but for me, what I need to do is I need to be with God, cognizant of my judgments, cognizant of my opinions, and understand they are coming from ego. Um, God doesn't have a contrary opinion of you vis-a-vis me. We're all God's kids. We're all equals. Um, All of my positionality uh, is coming from ego. Um, I've been working through an issue over the last week or so, and I've I've been, in, in, in my daily doings, I've been thinking about uh, non-attachment, non-positionality, and humility. And I've been talking to myself over and over. This is, this is where I need to be because position comes back in. But I'm right. I know I'm right, and I can prove it. It's right here. And you're wrong. I need to, I need to understand that's an ego position. Now, I might theoretically be right and you might theoretically be wrong, but it's still an ego position. And if I'm not aware of that, that's going to take me off someplace else. I'm going to, and I'm going to be in ego and alcoholism moving forward. I have to look at all my positions, all of my uh, opinions. Um, Second part of the question is, is ego always bad? Uh, if I have a power in my life, empowered by God, I'm going to be moving forward in a way that I should be moving forward regardless of ego. Um, if I'm treated, ego is treated. Again, um, semantics or whatever, I don't know that anybody ever gets rid of ego. I've been at a meeting where somebody who knew a whole lot about Alcoholics Anonymous got up and this person said that this person had completely gotten rid of their ego. (laughs) And I said, hallelujah. Um, It's, you know, I, I am participating in the human experience and this is the deal. If I have a power greater than me and a real relationship going on, why can't I get involved in politics? Why can't I take on a certain kind of cause? Why can't I do something in a positive way, contribute something positive to the world, if that's what it seems my abilities, if that's where they are? Um, It's all about a power, and it's all about being empowered by God. If, if, if I've got the power with me and I'm doing what God would have me do, the rest of these things are going to fall into line. It's not me doing the doing. I'm not, I'm not the person in charge. So it's really, it's, it's, it's where, where's the power? Time wise, we okay? One more? Okay. Please speak to or speak about what it means to you when it said the road gets narrower. Okay. Um, Trying to think of the term if it's the straight gate or the the narrow gate or whatever they talk about. Um, When, as I move forward in a program in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I grow spiritually. I become a lot more sensitive to these ego issues. I can't, I can't get away with stuff and be all right and be happy the way I was in earlier times. That's, this is actually what's, you know, been going on with me in the last week or so. It's, it, this issue is, it's, 
like one of those lingering hangnails or whatever that's going on. And six, seven years ago, it probably would not have bothered me. I would have blown it off. But I really notice these days when I am in irritability or when I, I just know that when I'm not in a good connected place and I'm not feeling happily and usefully whole, I know where that comes from. It's not him out there that did that to me. It's not her. It's not them. It's as within, so without. I'm responsible for all of my upset. It comes from me and no place else. So I know where it's coming from. And yet there's times when I'm just in it. And I can't, you know, I just can't seem to resolve it. And I know this is where my growth is coming from. This is where God says, okay, kid, here's your opportunity. Step six, let's go for it. Um, the road does get narrower. Um, I'm in, I'm, I'm trying to get into a new profession where I'm dealing with a whole lot of anxiety and, and depression and, 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 and helping folks work through their stuff. And, um, sometimes my job is to take on their stuff to be, to hold them psychologically and be with them. And, um, I feel that stuff. Sometimes I go home at night on the freeway, uh, the 405. And by the way, I have at least two and a half hours of spiritual experience on the 405 most every day. <laughs> and I'm on the freeway at, at 9.15, 9.30 at night, and I get on there, and the whole thing is stopped. It's well, use your own ex expletives here. Yeah. Um, and that's a spiritual experience. It, there's, there's my opportunity for acceptance. It's, it's me in an ego position. And I have a choice. I have a choice. Do I want to be happy? Do I want to have peace in my life? Like I say I do at all these meetings. Or do I want my ego position? Do I want to be right, or do I want to be at happy and be at peace? That's the deal. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.